Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome along to my presentation. Uh, my name is Cameron Francis, and I'll be presenting this afternoon on the topic of the problem of NBOM. Um, before we kick it off, though, I just want to acknowledge traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, just quickly, I'll tell you, who, who am I? I'm a social worker. I work in addictions, uh, particularly with young people as my specialty, uh, particularly complex young people, complex uh, alcohol and drug dependence in young people. But I've also had a really long interest in all areas of alcohol and other drug use, uh, and responses to that, particularly harm reduction responses and service responses and, and policy in particular. There's a large asterisk on the screen. Uh, the asterisk is there because I have to do a disclaimer and say that I'm here representing myself today. Uh, my views are my own and don't represent my employer. And also that the information I'm presenting is all on the public record. I'm not presenting anything that I've gained from my paid employment. Now, what I want to talk about today is the, the problem of NBOM, and I apologise being a bit of a Captain Bringdown, uh, talking about problems with drugs in a conference that is celebrating the potential of drugs. So I acknowledge that that's a bit weird, but we do have a bit of a problem with this substance at the moment, and what I'm going to do is talk a bit about how that has emerged, where the NBOMs have come from. I'm going to talk about uh, a timeline of adverse events that we've had in all over Australia. I'm not going to look at globally, I'm only going to focus on Australia today. A lot of the problem we've got is that we're having some issues with this drug, but we have actually no way nationally of monitoring those problems and documenting them and even recognising that there is a problem that exists. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to also talk about some of the health risks of NBOM, some of what the effects of NBOM are. I'm also going to show that the point of the presentation is obviously to demonstrate the need for a formal drug checking system or a pill checking system, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this drug has tested the limits of our system and it's shown us why uh, the system we've got in place is not working. There's also some implications for crowd care and there's I think probably one of the most serious implications and the problem of NBOM is the problem it presents for festivals uh, and crowd management and what do we do when we've got issues with this drug in our festival context because it actually is bringing up some really unique challenges for us. Uh, just a, a really quick history of the NBOMs. I don't want to go into too much detail on this. I know there's probably so many drug geeks in the audience you probably already know. Um, NBOMs were first discovered by Ralph Heim. He was looking at radio imaging uh, serotonin agonists and trying to find the most potent 5-HT2A serotonin agonists that they could find to basically stereo uh, radio image them in PET, PET scans and look at where those receptor sites are in the brain. So they were looking for really potent serotonin agonists. Um, the series was expanded by David Nichols, came along and looked at a whole bunch of extra ones and expanded them. Then, obviously, everyone was publishing all of this research. They appeared on the illicit market in about 2010, and then in Australia, we got our first adverse events in 2012. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just step you through a bunch of those adverse events. When I'm talking about NBOM, I'm, I'm talking about the three main ones. So we've got 25B, 25C and 25I NBOM. Um, I'm clustering them together. There are some differences between them and there are some differences in their pharmacological action. There's also differences in toxicology as well. But over time, it's actually looking like those differences are less and less. Um, some are potentially more risky than others. And as we go through this, you might see a bit of a pattern. Uh, one that comes up probably maybe more than others is 2,5-C NBOM. Uh, and there's a few potential reasons for that. But when I say NBOM, I'm talking about one or combo of the three. This is our first Australian adverse event was a bit of a cracker. Um, blunt craniofacial trauma as a manifestation of excited delirium caused by new psychoactive substances. Uh, beautiful medical euphemism. Um, this young person had consumed what they thought was MDMA uh, and had actually contained 2,5-CM bone, MBPBP, uh, and he actually ran in his head into light poles and concrete walls until he killed himself uh, in front of his friends, which was our first really obviously very extreme reaction from this drug. This got a bit of media attention because you can tell it's pretty gory, but that's our fir the first I could find anyway, published case report of a death from an embome in Australia. 
Not long after that, in Queensland, we had uh, a number of young people hospitalised after they purchased some powdered endbone, mixed it into a nasal spray, passed it around at a party. They don't keep, teach kids maths these days because no one worked out the doses and uh, everybody overdosed at this party. Uh, the ambulance was called at about one o'clock in the morning and found about 15 psychotic teenagers in an apartment. Um, the logistics in managing that's obviously really tricky. Uh, in the, in, while the ambos were triaging that, one guy went into a cardiac arrest and was survived. He was in a coma for a few days, but survived, and about four people hospitalised. So this was our first mass overdose of NBOM in Australia. Uh, not long after that, we had a death. The Nick Mitchell LSD death was not LSD. Um, this one was from the central coast of New South Wales. Uh, him and a mate took what they thought was LSD. They both flipped out really quite quickly. His mate ran off down the street, got hit by a car. Um, Ambos went and treated his mate, and then his mum came home and found that Nick was dead in his bed, and had actually had a cardiac arrest at home while his mate was out running down the streets, being chased around by ambulances. We then had a couple of balcony jumps, and these are so remarkably similar. We had this guy in Perth, and then it was followed really quickly by the Henry Kwan death, which got a lot of media attention. Henry had purchased what he thought was LSD off a friend who'd purchased it off Silk Road uh, and had took it at home, flipped out and jumped off the balcony in front of his, pe uh, in front of his mum. Um, this one got a lot of media attention and we did see uh, some you know, you know, joy at ban, which is a bit unfortunate that that was our only response to it is to try and make it illegal, but a very tragic case in that one. Uh, later on, now this is in 2013, we actually started getting NBOME in press tablets and this is a little unusual globally that Australia has got consistent numbers of press tablets turning up with NBOME in them. Um, this one is from Adelaide. There was about 21 people hospitalised in a weekend all across the entertainment precinct in Adelaide. Uh, ambulance noticed a number of unusual features including people who were stripping themselves off and rolling around on the road because they were extremely itchy. Um, two 5 cm bohm does create a really itchy effect in people. Some people get tingling. This is probably really high doses, and so that a lot of people were found writhing on the road, scratching themselves, which the ambos thought was a bit unusual. But overall, 21 people hospitalised in that weekend. We then got a second batch of pills up in Darwin, and these were the Snapchat tablets. A similar scenario, there was several overdoses in one night across a number of different nightclubs in the Darwin region uh, of people who'd taken different coloured Snapchat tablets, which later, this, these Snapchats, I think, had 25 i in BOEM, we found out later on. Then we had this one, and this is um, David Caldercott, who's obviously a legend that we all love. Uh, David identified this tablet through his emergency department in Calvary Hospital, and David had these tested and found that they contained a combo 25C and 25I and bone uh, together in a pre pressed tablet. Uh, initially thought they were hula girls, but actually probably Bugs Bunny, you can see there. <laughs> These Bugs Bunny tablets are quite interesting. So this is in, this is 2014. These tablets are still in circulation in Australia right now. And if you go on pill reports, we've got reports of these in Brisbane from February this year. So one of the issues we've had, and the reason why we need a drug checking system so urgently, is that we are having batches of tablets like this uh, remaining in circulation for years and years and years. They disappear for a few months, they reappear in another city. We have another spate of mass ODs. They disappear and they reappear again and we actually have no system of tracking it. What I did was use the media basically looking for media reports. Now if we went beyond that and looked at a formal sets of data from EDs or coronial databases we'll find heaps more cases from it. So but we actually are not doing any of that surveillance at the moment at all. Oh then this is a funny one. This is one I found on the media as well. Uh, a guy attacked a bunch of hospital staff after being brought into hospital uh, uh, combative and agitated, and he'd taken uh, a tablet with a blue scissors. Seem familiar? <laughs> Hooray. 
So that's about a year after their first presentation. So we've got them continually circulating throughout the whole market. This is another one. This was a warning put out from WA. They actually had two batches of NBOM in tablets across a New Year's Eve, the 20 or so people hospitalised. Um, the police in WA seemed pretty cool. They got this warning out straight away with a photograph of a tablet pretty much the next day, which is good on them for doing that. A lot of other states are not doing it. Uh, but then we've also seen the same similar tablets. So in the Hawkesbury about a year later, uh, also still in circulation. These blue, bat the blue Batmans are still around again as, as well at the moment. So I'll take you now to a bigger and more spectacular case study from a little bit more recently. This is October 2016. The uh, Gold Coast mass overdose, which you might be familiar with, this got a lot of media attention. Uh, this was across a weekend in Surface Paradise. By the end of the weekend, there was a bit over 20 people hospitalised. There was one person dead uh, from consuming ca capsules with a white powder in it, uh, which nobody knew what was in it. A, a member of the ambulance service conveniently told the police it was probably flacker. Um, the media googled flacker and realised that's the zombie drug and so we had the zombie drug hysteria of October 2016. Um, a really, really unhelpful scenario. We got basically no useful information out to the public at all. We got no information to people who use drugs around what is this thing that has knocked people over, what should we be looking out for. All we got was zombies are coming to get us. Pretty embarrassing really. You can imagine the response. We got a really strong policing response. There was a car race on the next weekend. The cops were very nervous about their car race being ruined by the zombie drug and promised to crack down harder than ever. Um, the Triple C, the Crime and Corruption Commission, actually used coercive powers. So they got all the people involved in that overdose and put them in essentially a star chamber where they must give evidence or else they will be imprisoned. Now those powers were designed for high level organised crime and here we are applying them on people who OD'd on a uh, nasty drug. So awesome response, go Queensland. I'm from Queensland, I can say that. The police then helpfully released their, uh, their vest footage and the little cameras the police wear. They released the footage of people freaking out and overdosing and put it on the news with very little uh, covering of people's faces. I'm not going to show you the video. I nearly did. My partner informed me it's really disturbing, and it is, but it's still online if you'd like to watch it. I don't know what the point of that was. It's the police reminding us that drugs are both dangerous and illegal. Thank you. Um, <laughs> The headline news, we got that footage was, you know, front page news, we got zombie imagery, we got people screaming in videos on the, uh, you know, nightly news. There's one of the photos not really covering people up. This guy's being looked after by the police quite helpfully, helping him to a paddy wagon while he's having a pretty severe psychedelic reaction. Finally, about nearly a week later, the Queensland Police revealed the ingredients of the capsules and what they said it contained was an amphetamine type substance, which is pretty broad and not helpful. Uh, it also contained uh, synthetic LSD is what the media reported, which we later found out was 2,5-CM uh, bone uh, with also traces of MDMA. Freaky, freaky combination of drugs. Um, we got lots of this guy, we got lots of our archetypal dad in the media, like just reminding us how bad drugs are and you really shouldn't take them. <laughs> Meanwhile, we got nothing useful for people to take drugs through any of this. We knew a little bit from the media that some of the people hospitalised had snorted the capsules. That was probably really, really important. We know that the end bone hallucinogens are way more active when they're snorted. They're, we used to think they're not super orally active until people take big doses. So one of the bits of advice that we suspect should have come out of this was don't snort your caps, even for just that weekend to say, hey, that's, snorting is probably more dangerous than taking these things orally, so let's lay off. But we got none of that. I then just discovered recently, I only just discovered this when I was putting the presentation together, WA had a presentation as well across a, a few months later in uh, around Christmas time of 2016. They got three people hospitalised. Um, WA police helpfully put a picture out of the capsule with a white fluffy powder in it. They also got a full forensic analysis which they put out straight away. Four fluoroamphetamine, 2,5-CN bone, traces of MDMA.
Uh, fluoroamphetamine is pretty toxic on its own. Combining it with 2,5-C, probably really, really dangerous together. The fact that there was traces of MDMA in these caps is a real concern as well, because it probably would fool your reagent test kit, and you're probably going to get a black or purple black reaction on a reagent tester. And we really needed to know that very quickly so we could get that advice out to people that, hey, your test kits are not going to work on this one, unfortunately. Then a couple of weeks later, we had another disaster. This one from the Chapel Street nightclub region in Melbourne at Revolver and a number of other clubs. At the end of this weekend, there was about 20 something people hospitalized, initially one death. And then after a couple of days, we had three people dead. This would normally be quite big news, and often deaths like this are the windows that open up for policy change when governments go, hey, we've got to do something different. Um, unfortunately, that didn't really happen in Victoria. Um, Monica Barrett, who is here, very helpfully managed to get a sample of the caps from Chapel Street and through some underground connections got a sample of them off to Barcelona to energy control for testing. And guess what they contained? 4FA, 2,5-CM bohm, and MDMA. So these caps had knocked over 20-something people on the Gold Coast, a group of people in Perth, more people later. We had at least four months of this drug circulating, four confirmed deaths, potentially more that we actually don't know about. We, these are the ones we know because of the media. We don't know of all of them. Now, just after this, about a week after Monica got those results out of energy control and published them, Someone leaked this to the media, and this is a screenshot. I think someone's taken a photo of a computer screen. This is Victorian Police safety alert on the existence of these, of these caps. And they've got photographs of the caps, they've got photographed a large bag of powder, meaning that there's a significant quantity there, and confirmed results. But guess what? Not for public distribution. I don't know whose safety they're concerned about, but not the public. The most concerning thing here was that the police were worried that their own reagent test kit might accidentally identify MDMA. So they warned their members to arrest anyone with a capsule just in case. So no public warning at all around this, which is actually really unethical and I think highly problematic. Uh, David Caldicott came across a sample about two weeks later. He had a seizure come through Calvary Hospital, which he treated. He got a sample off the patient and had them tested and found, once again, 4-FA, 2-5-CM bohm. The only difference here, no MDMA in this sample. So someone has added MDMA somewhere along the line there, and this sample, particular sample didn't have it in there, which is interesting. Then this, what looks like a fairly boring piece of media, St Albans siege, cops raided a house, someone pulled a gun, blah, blah, blah. But in it came out that this was the syndicate who had been distributing the, this combo. And also in it was this little line at the end where the court also heard a Kings Park woman was arrested at Southern Cross Station in December carrying 15 kilos of 4FA and 2,5-CM bone. 15 kilos in December. Now imagine that in circulation, given that we've got a really high risk of harm from that particular combo. So Vic police didn't just know about it in January, they knew about it in December. We actually went through potentially a festival season with this information being kept a big secret, which is obviously really unethical and that's a massive, massive problem. So, that's our disaster stories. What do we know about these NBOMs after all of this time? Now, there's enough case reports globally to start clustering the case reports into their type. So we can start to look at what are some of the themes coming out in the harms. And one of there's, you can almost classify, particularly the deaths, into two categories. There's the agitation slash delirium. There's people who are becoming acutely delirious and injuring themselves, self-harming. There's lots of cases of people jumping, people stabbing themselves, people killing themselves under the influence while they're in a very intense delirious state, which is a bit different to your classic hallucinogenic state, where people are really unaware of their surroundings. Then the others tend to be some of the pharmacological effects of the drug itself. So uh, people having seizures, uh, obviously high heart rate and high blood pressure, hypothermia. So there's what looks like a partial serotonin toxicity, not the full serotonin syndrome that we're used to with MDMA. And it's usually actually pretty easy to identify in a clinical setting. Uh, instead, people are presenting with some of the symptoms of serotonin toxicity, particularly the hypothermia. 
The other one which we know much more about now is the rhabdomyolysis, and it does seem like there is a toxicological, uh, pharmacological action of the embolomes which is increasing risk of rhabdo. Um, so rhabdo is where the muscle starts to break down and the kidneys are struggling to process all of that protein. So people are, initially will start having uh, their wee, looks like Coca-Cola, really brown coloured wee, uh, confusion, vomiting, and then eventually renal failure as the kidneys fail to process all the protein. So again, the rhabdo is probably a direct action of envoim, unfortunately. So we've got two types of harm. There's one from the agitation delirium, and then there's the other is from some of the, the toxicological effects on the body. So what are the implications of all of this? this it's probably safe to say the envoims are more harmful than other classic hallucinogens. And I think I get the cognitive liberty argument. If you want to take envoim for enlightenment, go nutso. Um, however, if we compare the envoims to our classic hallucinogens, we're looking really, really, really different. You just don't experience some of those harms from LSD, psilocybin, heaps of our other classic psychedelics. Enbone has got a different safety profile. There's probably some people more at risk than others. There's probably some co-drug interactions as well. The, the mixture of enbones with uh, amphetamines or MDMA is potentially risky, and that could be part of it. But whatever the case, it's safe to say that the enbones are more harmful than our classic hallucinogens. Obviously, the illicit market makes it all worse. The illicit market makes it hard for us to track it and puts a profit incentive on selling more of it, et cetera, et cetera. And we wouldn't have this problem if we didn't have such an outrageous illicit drug market. We really need to approach it from a public health perspective rather than this nasty policing perspective, obviously. A public health approach would involve, like, if we had 20 people appear at an ED with a mystery disease, how do you think it would be dealt with? We'd send in public health people to do a bit of classic epidemiology. They'd interview people, they'd find out where they'd eaten, who they'd hung out with. They'd do a bit of, you know, they'd do contact tracing. If it's a measles outbreak, we'd look at who these people hung out with. Let's ring them and say, hey, you might have been exposed to measles. We would actually do a public health approach. We'd be trying to track the origins of the problem, work out what messaging we need to get out to the affected at-risk population and getting that messaging out there really quickly. And actually in Australia, we're really good at that public health stuff. We've got an awesome public health system. We just unfortunately don't apply it to this particular problem. There's big implications for crowd care at festivals, I'm very sorry to say. In the past, someone flipping out on a bad trip, we're not normally worried about their physical health. We're pretty confident that we can talk them through it, that bad trips are often not that bad in the end. Often people have really amazing experiences even after freaking out on the ground for 12 hours. But um, <laughs> unfortunately, with the endbones, uh, and I should say endbones turned up in every form, it's in blotter, tablet, liquid, powder, it's in every form that you could imagine. Um, we actually have to treat all of our bad trips as a little bit risky. And we have to consider some of our bad trips might actually be endbone intoxication. And if they are, that we've got some, some implications on how we manage that. If we're in a remote location, what do we, how do we treat rhabdo in the bush at a doof? We kind of can't. We've actually got to transport people out, and that's a massive problem. The agitation delirium means we've got to physically restrain people. How do we do that in a doof? It's not a nice thing. Uh, we need physical restraint and chemical restraint, and we don't have those tools on hand in a remote location. And unfortunately, the endbombs are out there. The other implication is that we know health services and law enforcement have got this information right now, and they're not sharing it. And we need access to it as the affected population and people with an interest in it. We need to get access to this info. And I think that there's a few avenues that are definitely worth exploring. A right to information request to public health services would be a really interesting angle to do an RTI request or a freedom of information request and say, hey, what do you got? Um, law enforcement won't hand it over, they'll say it's operational, but health services, hey, they've got an obligation to the public health, so what about that? Obviously also it demonstrates a need for drug checking, duh. Yeah, we really need drug checking urgently. If we had drug checking at a festival that identified NBOM, that's going to shape your response to it. If we've got people presenting at your door, f freaking out on a psychedelic, if we can confirm it's not NBOM, 
awesome, we'll talk them down, we'll be cool. If we're in a remote location and we go test a pill and go, we got M-bone, okay, we've got a serious medical problem on our hands. And so the drug checking is obviously crucial right now. And I know that a lot of, unfortunately, authorities have said things like, well, we don't know evidence that drug checking works. Um, I presented evidence that our current approach ain't working. Um, so if the police could come up with something better, I'd love to hear it. But unfortunately, uh, we seem to keep getting more and more casualties. Um, Cameron, have you heard any user reports of positive experiences with Embo? Yeah, absolutely, actually. When Embo first came out, particularly on Blue Light, people were reporting massive, life-changing experiences. Yeah, people had really amazing experiences from it. So I don't doubt that it's possible. Um, the yeah. right dosing and... Uh, well, this part we don't know actually. Is it just the dose? Is there uh, co-drug interactions that are concerned? We don't actually know that part yet, exactly what that is. Dose would be a bit of it, but it may not be all of it. Just because some of the clusters we've had, we've had people consuming similar doses amongst their friends and one person's got the complication. So we don't exactly know, but if we were to have some good, decent research into it, we'd probably work it out. Yeah. Thank you. What advice would you say that I could give to a medical team at a festival in terms of how to respond to something that might be in bomb Good question. To the people like medical services and stuff at festivals, what can you do? Um, I think you'd probably want to be looking for things like how are you going to manage agitation and delirium. In the in some of the clinical research, the case reports are looking at really high doses of benzos, especially things like lorazepam and midaz. They're also using midaz or propofol and totally knocking people out on it. Um, people are taking usually quite high doses of benzos in order to get them down again. They're also there's some of the case reports have used different types of antipsychotics as well. So lanzapine or droperidol, haloperidol in a couple of cases as well to try and manage the agitation. Um, then, then you'd be looking for a thing, and I don't know what's, what, how much equipment you've got, but can you check the creatinine levels and check to see whether there's rhabdo on the way or not um, would be another useful thing because that seems to be where the deaths are occurring, those two, it seems to be what's doing it. All right, thank you very much for this insightful presentation. Thank you.